Okay, so let's start. Um, this is the last of the series for this academic year. And uh, I guess we're getting close to the end of the semester, so people are busy. And, uh, but in any case, um, I'm honored to have our colleague, uh, Professor Dave Aiken, here. Um, Dave is a faculty member in the Aerospace Department, as well as Maryland Robotics Center and the Institute for Systems Research. Um, his area of research deals with uh, a number of very important uh, topics, which includes space systems and operation, space human factors, tele-robotics, space system simulations, and space application of artificial intelligence. Uh, Dave received his bachelor, master's, and PhD from MIT, and he's been one of our very active faculty members. His projects with NASA are some of the highlights of, uh, I would say, what we do here in the college. So here, with no further ado, Dave. Well, thank you for coming. Um, I apologize when they first asked me to do this. They said, what do you want for a topic, a title for your presentation? And uh, being totally you know, out of it for whatever reason, I came up, well, I don't know, just say current research in the space systems lab, I don't know. And so this is a title I would have done had I been thinking at the time when I was asked for a title. Um, it's, it, is, it actually still is the research we do in the space systems lab, but it sounds better this way. Um, so for those of you who don't know, this is kind of an overview of the space systems lab. Um, we have two facilities, uh, a robotics lab in Kim and the neutral buoyancy research facility that way. Um, I kind of divide what we do into five areas. Uh, human systems and robotic systems, and then human robotic interactions, which is a very active area that we've worked in for a long time, and then systems design and spaceflight programs. And so I'm going to try to hit a little bit of all of this today. Um, I suspect this audience is going to be primarily interested in space robotics, so I apologize when I get to the space human factors, you can take a nap. Or you can take a nap in space robotics if you want. Um, let me kind of go back to the early years and, and tell you that I apologize, you're not going to get to see a lot of partial differential equations today because I'm actually a design professor. And so most of what we do in the Space Systems Lab is we design things and we build them and we test them. And then we design them again and make them better. Um, so it's, and the, the primary out area of application is in how to do useful work in space, right? It's a unique environment, very different than, than robotics in the field or in, in applications in most of Earth. Has a lot of similarity to undersea, and we'll, I'll talk about that as I go through it. Um, so the lab really started as a human factors and a robotics lab. These are some of our early programs um, looking at uh, multiple robots doing formation flying, walking robots in the microgravity environment underwater. Um, we have not built walking robots in 1G, but if we decide to go for the DARPA Grand Challenge, we may have to do that. Uh, Space structure assembly, this is uh, the original design of the space station truss being assembled by, by our first robot. Multiple cooperating robots, whether in the case of a free-flying camera robot that's providing a view of this dexterous teleoperator, inserting, inserting a pair of foot restraints in a Hubble Space Telescope that an astronaut's going to use to do uh, human servicing, or a uh, dexterous robot as a front end for a big crane-type manipulator, or free-flying robots, or orbital maneuvering vehicle simulator, which is actually moving a simulated Russian nuclear reactor, um, which was fun, although it, it actually, you can't tell by looking at it. Um, I'll go into more detail on sort of what we're currently working on, uh, which is continuing to try to advance the state of the art in dexterous robotics for difficult environments like space and undersea. Uh, complex satellite service, servicing, this is our robot uh, doing the servicing tasks on Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, lightweight modular self-reconfiguring robots, free-flying camera platforms, and deep submergence manipulators for the undersea environment. Um, in no particular order, the f when I first moved the laboratory to the University of Maryland in 1990, I gave the students in the lab at the time a design exercise 
uh, noting that every neutral buoyancy facility in the country would try to create, uh, have video coverage by taking a video camera and putting it in a watertight housing, which meant it was very large and very bulky, handing it to a person in scuba gear and saying, okay, swim around until you get to just the right position that we want to see the image from, and then when we tell you, hold the camera absolutely perfectly still while you swim in place. Right, this is not a good use of people. And I said, we're a robot lab, we ought to have a robotic camera platform. And we're a space lab, so what we don't want to do is to build a platform that is an ROV, a re uh, remotely operated undersea vehicle with a keel and a fixed orientation. We want a vehicle that to the extent possible is a spacecraft. All of our free-flying vehicles, we go to a great deal of effort from the design phase through the implementation to make sure that the center of mass is coincident with the center of buoyancy so it has no preferred orientation. Uh, neutral buoyancy basically means we adjust the total buoyancy so it's just on the edge where it's not quite floating and it's not quite sinking. And that's as close as you can come passively to long duration microgravity on Earth without paying $10,000 a flight hour to go uh, on what NASA affectionately calls the vomit comet and uh, get 20 or 30 seconds of, of zero G at a time. So the SCAMP system is what came out of that design exercise. Uh, it's a free-flying camera. We have six thrusters oriented, so we have um, decoupled thrust in all six degrees of freedom, roll, pitch, yaw, X, Y, Z. Um, different interchangeable camera platforms. We have two vehicles, and the original intent behind this was that we were going to play technological leapfrog, which was we would get one vehicle up to a certain operating level, get it really robust, then we would take the other vehicle, strip it, bring it up to the next operating level past that. When it becomes robust, it starts being the operational system, and then this one gets stripped and taken to the next step. That worked fine as long as there was long-term NASA, stable NASA funding. So right now we have one functional vehicle and one hangar queen. Uh, we've done a lot of studies on this. This is using it as an assistant to a person pretending to be an astronaut carrying tool boards and so forth. Uh, this was some work we did on vis visual servoed uh, flight control where you basically were tracking uh, a optical target based on color and shape and size and uh, the task was to maintain a constant um, separation distance and pointing towards that object. Uh, the vehicle has full onboard three axis rate sensors, uh, uh, accelerometers and magnetometers as well as depth sensor. Um, we also, thanks to Derek Paley, have a system of 12 motion capture cameras in the tank. So with optical targets on the outside, we can do full state feedback on this vehicle. And our next step is to actually close that loop and make the vehicle behave as if it were a spacecraft, taking out the water drag effects. And we have all the sensor data we need to do that now. It's just a matter of getting the funding to finish up the software to let that happen. Yeah. Yeah, we actually um, have done that. Um, we, it's, it's so seldom they're both functional at the same time <laughs> that um, what we really primarily used it for was use it doing uh, formation flying based on visual cues. So one would play follow the leader with the other and try to track it. Um, we have done that for two independent. The, the real issue with that is we only have one control station. Uh, and when we use it as a monitoring camera platform, um, it's primarily teleoperated. Although these days we can do autonomous control as well. And, you know, say, go to that position, hold. Um, kind of continuing the free flight aspect, one of our current programs that's pretty interesting is DimaFlex, which we, you know, it's a space flight program. You've got to have an acronym. And so that stands for Dynamic Manipulation Flight Experiment. Um, this is the Air Force Na University Nanosat program, which I have taken to calling um, the Air Force equivalent of Hunger Games. Because they, they pick ten universities who, who each propose a flight program in a, in a nanosat up to 50 kilogram region. They give them an incredibly small amount of money, $110,000 for two years. With that money, you're supposed to develop a completely space-certified vehicle 
and they run you through all kinds of hoops in terms of design reviews and stuff like that. And at the end of the two years, one of the ten universities gets to go on to flight. So it's um, not the most generous program ever invented, but it is a, a quite an interesting program. And uh, one of the sort of recurring themes as I go through the talk is the fact that there's a very interesting phenomena in the space business, particularly the space robotics business. If you want to fly a robot in space, the first thing you must do is to demonstrate that you have already flown a robot in space. Right, and so what that basically means is MDA, the Canadian company that makes the big manipulator on space shuttle and space station, is the only organization in the free world that gets to build and fly robots because they are the only people who ever have flown a robot, which is because they gave the first robot for free to NASA. Um, so we're hoping this is an opportunity to, p to get past that catch-22 and actually get flight data on a non-Canadian robot. Uh, speaking of flight data on robots, we did have a very interesting program for a number of years. Sorry, did you say yeah. 50 kilogram? 50 kilogram total. total. Um, it's about a half meter on a side. In fact, the, the, that's the boundary restrictions. And it would fly as a secondary payload. So you have to find somebody that's willing to fly your system along with the, the one they're paying for. Um, many years ago, actually 1993, I proposed to NASA that um, another catch-22 on robots is that uh, the experience had been that if you propose to fly a dexterous robot, I'm talking about a robot like this one that's intended to have the same capabilities as an astronaut in a spacesuit. Um, as time goes by, and uh, there's no joke actually, you may have heard, um, which says uh, an elephant is a mouse built to NASA specifications. And so as time goes by, you know, you, you come up with a simple project, and uh, before you know it, it's a billion dollar project, and then it becomes canceled because it's too expensive. Um, so, and robot, robotics has been like that for 30 years. And so, I said, look, we will do this as a university experiment. We'll fl fly it. There's a lot of history I'm not going to take the time to go into. Uh, buy me a beer sometime, and I'll, I'll tell you all the sad stories. Um, but uh, the, the bottom line was this was a $20 million program, and we were going to fly a, a, syst a robotic servicing system on the space shuttle with four manipulators, two Dexter's arms you see here, a positioning leg, and then a, th a fourth camera that's not installed in the 1G application that carried a stereo camera pair to give us a wide range of camera views. Uh, instead of doing like, how many of you know, have heard of Robonaut, the humanoid robot that they flew to the space station? Well, this is not a humanoid robot, purposely. Um, we didn't want to try to do anthropomorphic hands, so we did interchangeable end effectors, and this is the end effector suite. This is the control station with uh, stereographic overlay on stereo, live stereo uh, video. Um, complete system, we built the system. It was uh, the first unit was, uh, worked very nicely. It was, uh, works underwater. It also works in the laboratory environment in 1G without counter, uh, counterweighting. Um, the, the design passed through NASA flight certification for flight and operation on the space shuttle, which is the first U.S. built robot that ever successfully did that. And we had 70% of the flight unit um, fabricated ready to assemble when NASA canceled the program. Um, which was actually a time uh, that was both around the time of the Columbia accident and was a time that they discovered a cost overrun in a uh, space station of something like four and a half billion dollars where their first response was, okay, we'll zero out all the university funding. Which as I like to say is if you can't, sort of like the, an attitude of, I can't make the mortgage on my house, let me look under the cushions of the couch to see if there's any change. Um, but we've been operating this system for the, uh, another 10 years since that. We have literally thousands of hours on the system, um, and it works beautifully. Um, in 2004, after the Columbia accident, 
um, NASA was had been directed by the Columbia Accident Investigation Board to consider not flying another human mission to service Hubble Space Telescope because if anything went wrong, the crew had no safe haven. They had to come down after two weeks. They would have to, and if there was another uh, fault like uh, the breach of the thermal protection system on Columbia, the crew was basically dead. And so NASA was, was told, study the opportunity for a purely robotic servicing mission. Now, we've been doing robotic servicing of Hubble since the mid-80s, right? It's our standard test case because there's a lot of good data. So we're thinking, this is a no-brainer. I've got 70% of a flight-certified robot locked in a closet. We went to NRL, and they had a complete propulsion stage that NASA had already bought and paid for locked in a uh, nitrogen-filled box. And we said, OK, let us do it. We'll complete the robot. We'll put it on this upper stage. We'll do the mission. It's going to be cheap. It's going to be great. And NASA said, but you've never flown a robot in space, so let us go to Canada and give them hundreds of millions of dollars for one of their robots that, that, because they've already flown robots. However, they came back to us and said, well, you know, there's a problem with this Canadian robot, which is that it can't lift its own weight in 1G. And the only ground trainer we have is something that kind of goes like this with a whole structure of weights and cables and counterweights and things like that. And they said, could you perhaps modify your system to replicate the kinematics of the Canadian system? And uh, then you could do our, our validation and verification tasks for us. So they gave us an obscenely small amount of money. This is another recurring theme of my presentation. And they said, OK, it was, so it's easy. Um, let's see, the dexterous arms had to be tripled in length. The positioning leg had to be doubled in length. We had to build this body, which violated every rule we had ever come up with on robot design, trying to keep the arms close together, close coupled, where you can support each other, reach into the same spaces that are human cap uh, accessible spaces. And the worst one of all, we had to take off our beloved interchangeable end effector mechanisms and put on these lousy end effectors that the Canadians laughingly called or uh, orbital tool change mechanisms, which are roughly the size and shape of a trash can. So if you can imagine doing fine servicing tasks with two trash cans for your hands, that's what the Canadian system is like. However, it turns out when we designed this system, we designed it uh, to be very highly modular. All of the electronics are co-located in the joints. Uh, we only pass serial data and power down through the links. All of the wiring is internal. So we had to build some new arm link segments. We had to build uh, for the everything. We had to build a new body and we had to take off our end effectors and put on their pieces of crap. Um, but the length of time we were down in transition, once we had built all the pieces, was eight hours. Because it's not just, you know, it's not just the mechanisms were designed to be modular, the electronics were designed to be modular and reconfigurable, the um, software was designed to be modular and reconfigurable. So this is the same Hubble Space Telescope mock-up that they used to train the, the shuttle ast the astronauts who did servicing. This is an axial instrument, which is about the size of a telephone booth, for those of you who are old enough to remember telephone booths. Um, so in the water, it has an apparent mass on the order of six or 700 pounds. To put this into uh, the, the uh, receptacle in Hubble Space Telescope, this edge and the corresponding edge on the far side of the top each have to be aligned within 50 thousandths of an inch. And we did that routinely day after day. And in fact, over the course of the four months of the program, we did all the tasks that the crew was, had been asked to do on what became SM4, the last uh, Hubble servicing mission, um, and demonstrated that robots were complete. Even a robot in this crippled configuration um, was completely capable of doing the full Hubble servicing mission. And around that time, the NASA administrator left. Uh, Mike Griffin, who's a graduate not just of the University of Maryland, but of the Department of Aerospace Engineering, became the new NASA administrator. And one of the first things he did was, was to say, oh, robots are completely incapable of doing Hubble servicing. Cancel this program. We're sending the shuttle up again. 
So that was a really good program while it lasted. Um, we were really interested in servicing as a commercial endeavor. Uh, the Ranger arms, not these Ranger arms, the Ranger arms in the original design, um, like I said, were designed to be as capable as an astronaut in a spacesuit. But each dexterous manipulator, which is eight degrees of freedom plus two tool drives, is about 180 pounds. And so if you're trying to do commercial satellite servicing, and the servicing spacecraft is of the same size as a satellite you're going to go fix, and you have to buy the same size launch vehicle as a satellite you're going to go fix, you're better off buying a new satellite and put it on that launch vehicle and send the new satellite into orbit. So what you really need are smaller, lighter, dexterous servicing systems. Um, Proteus is a system we came up with under um, uh, some short-term DARPA funding. Uh, this is the elbow module from Ranger, two degrees of freedom along with all the electronics um, that gave us the full um, human equivalent force and speed and uh, uh, dexterity at the, eventually at the end tip. And this module weighs 46 pounds. This is another two degree of freedom module, ha has all the same capabilities as this one, and it weighs four pounds. So we could basically went from a system that was 180 pounds to, for a dexterous arm to a system where we could build a complete dexterous arm for less than 10 kilograms. Um, sorry about mixing my units. Uh, which was, you know, worked great and with our, the modular architecture that we had and, and with some extensions that we designed, came up with uh, what we called a Proteus toolbox. So instead of sending up a robot to service a, a spacecraft, you would send up pieces of robots. And for every task or category of tasks you had to do, you could have a system, I actually had a, a student do a nice thesis using genetic algorithms given the pieces of the toolbox and a, you know, some characteristics of the task you had to do, here is the, the optimum uh, kinematic configuration to put yourself together in to go do the task. Um, so you didn't even have to have humans in that loop. So you had different actuators, different uh, lengths, of, lengths of links, different end effectors, uh, some specialized modules like free-flying spacecraft module. Uh, nodes contained electronics and also contained, uh, so the base nodes also contained uh, power supplies. Many nodes just contained electronics and splitters for the data networks. So for example, I could take a bunch of pieces and one of the configurations we came up with for servicing Hubble if we wanted to service Hubble we were going to have a series of legs so instead of having to have specialized grapple fixtures to hold the robot in place, we could grab the EVA handrails that are all over Hubble uh, to stabilize ourselves. We have a, a positioning manipulator that would bring the dexterous front end, which is two uh, seven degree of freedom dexterous arms with interchangeable end effectors into position. We had cameras on the base, cameras on the servicing head, cameras on the free flight vehicle. So after you delivered it to Hubble, you could have the, the free flight vehicle back off and serve the fa same function as our SCAMP vehicle and giving controllable external views of the work site. Um, so this was great, uh, although DARPA decided it was too NASA-y and NASA decided that uh, it didn't look like Robonaut. Uh, but we took the technology and have applied it to a number of different applications. This is Samurai, um, and this was a program that started under the NASA Astrobiology Program and was eventually completed under NSF uh, Office of Polar Programs. It's a uh, six degree of freedom deep submergence manipulator. Most manipulator sampling systems in the undersea environment are good to about 2,000 meters. This one's good to 6,000 meters. Um, the application for this was um, to go to the bottom of the Arctic Ocean, look for hydrothermal vents, find life forms around the hydrothermal vents, pick them up with the arm, put them in sampling containers, and come back to the surface. And oh yeah, um, you're going through sea ice, which means you're dropped into a hole, you're staging off of an icebreaker, you're dropping through a hole that the icebreaker made, uh, the ice shifts during the 36 hours the vehicle is on this little sortie, which means if you have a, a tether with surface communications, it will get cut and you will lose it. 
So it has to be completely autonomous, including the business about recognizing life forms and picking them up. And then, just to make it interesting, at the end of the mission, it's got to find the same hole in the ice you went down through. Um, the vehicle was built by Woods Hole. We built uh, the manipulator, the vision system, and the autonomy system that allowed us to do vision-based um, recognition of life forms. Although we cheated, we based, would, uh, d came up with a, uh, a concept of operations where the vehicle would do photographic coverage ahead of time. And then the scientists, we came up with a, a, a graphical user interface where the project scientists could designate I want one of these and two of those, and if you get one of those, then give me one of those, but if you don't get one of those, then give me two of these, and then load that into the system and send it down on the mission. Um, but the NASA program ran out of money before we had a chance to get an icebreaker to go to the Arctic, so um, the Woods Hole guys went without us with their vehicle and found out that within the region of the Arctic, they actually, this is the first vehicle, and to date, still the only vehicle that's ever been to the bottom of the Arctic Ocean. It's the deepest um, uh, vent field on the, on the planet, four and a half kilometers down. The pressure this is designed for is 8,000 pounds per square inch. Um, and um, what they found when they got to the bottom of the Arctic Ocean is unlike the Atlantic and Pacific subduction zones where you see these black smokers, these intense uh, vent fields with uh, hot superheated water coming up carrying all kinds of nutrients. Evidently the surface of the Arctic Ocean is just cracked and stuff is coming up, seeping up all over the place and the entire bottom of the, of the Arctic Ocean is covered with primordial ooze. It's this six inch deep yellow microbial mat that's everywhere. So it wasn't all that interesting a place to go, as it turns out. We actually have a uh, proposal on now to take this to the Antarctic and do life form surveys under the Ross Ice Shelf, which hopefully we'll get a chance to do. Um, we're very interested in planetary surface exploration. This is, and one of the things, since NASA is not real good about supporting um, research, is to leverage things like my senior design class. So. Two years ago, um, the senior design class was tasked with designing a, a, the lightest, smallest rover you could come up with that could do sampling, could follow astronauts along, and so forth. It's a three-wheeled rover with a free-swiveling rear wheel, so we only have two driven wheels, and we steer by differential drive. Um, let me give you a word of advice. If you ever have to build a rover, the number of wheels should be evenly divisible by two. Um, this is not a configuration we would ever do again. But this is um, sampling, this is actually part of the desert rats test um, that, w that was uh, from 2010 and we were doing sample collection uh, under remote control and uh, I have some more pictures of this coming up. Yes? Well the real trick is because the rear wheel is free swiveling, if you try to drive cross slope the gravity effects pulls the rear, the, the back end down. You can't resist it because the wheel, the wheel free swivels. And so if you try to drive cross slope, it basically will, at a certain critical angle, which is really small, um, the back end will, will break and then you'll just roll down the, the slope backwards. Uh, so what, you know, I think this, this could be mitigated by going to active steering on the rear wheel. We're actually, we have a four-year program with NASA to do this in conjunction with Arizona State University. Um, they're doing the science and we're doing the technology. And the plan is in the coming year, we have one, one more field trial coming up next month with this system. And then in the coming year, we will go do a, a new rover design, which will be actively steered and four-wheel drive, four-wheel steer. And that'll take care of all the problems. So I can't say that it's not clear that you couldn't make this work but I'd, I'd want to go to four wheels. Maybe six. Six could be good. Um, kind of going back to the first page with human systems, and I can see I'm going to have to go a little faster. Um, these are some of the kinds of things we do. A lot of uh, pressure suit work, a lot of work on um, buyer instrumentation that is functional inside a pressure suit, advanced uh, suit design advanced life support design, and then uh, biomechanics in terms of 
This is actually looking at walking at uh, lunar and, and Mars gravities using the motion capture system, which are the pretty lights behind you, which is, in fact, I think the same picture this is. Um, so you can see our test subject is actually ballasted, not just so that he's got the proper lunar weight, which is what this image is, uh, but that it's distributed appropriately on the major body segments. Um, if you're walking, the speed of walking is governed by the Froude number. Uh, the simpler way to explain it is in, in a walking motion, you don't actively use your muscles to any great extent to move your trailing leg back to the front. It's a pendulum motion, strictly gravity driven. And so the speed of walking is a function of the pendulum frequency of your leg. Um, so in different gravity, so, um, you know, for example, NASA loves to use a counterweight system where you put this person in a harness and the harness is attached to a gimbal and the gimbal's attached to a very sweet actively controlled uh, uh, electric actuator system that counteracts the, uh, you know, five-sixths of the force of gravity. But the legs are still in Earth gravity. So they're saying, oh, we're, you know, they did a study, how far can you walk on the moon? It says, oh, we could walk 10 kilometers or 20 kilometers but the legs are still in Earth gravity. Even though the force on the legs is reduced, the pendulum frequency is unchanged. So at least here, by doing the body segment parameter, we have the effects of drag, which is unfortunate, but we, we are having the appropriate pendulum frequencies because of the buoyancy effects. Uh, so a combination of the optical targets and the uh, 12 motion capture cameras let us get very fine resolution on gate and uh, we also use this for other under, you know, space motion, like moving about habitats, that sort of thing. We've done a lot of work down through the years in spacesuits. Uh, we used to be, go down to the uh, water tank at NASA Marshall in Huntsville, Alabama, and use NASA suits, uh, actual flight type suits. But that closed down in the late 90s. We realized back then if we were going to continue the research, we we're going to have to have a spacesuit, and that meant Effectively, we have to design and build our own. This is MX-2. It's a second-generation spacesuit. It is fully pressurized at this uh, three and a half psi. Um, it's designed for the neutral buoyancy environment, so it incorporates integral ballasting. You have to adjust ballast around the suit based on the, who the test subject is to get the right neutral buoyancy and to try to get them where not only are they neutral up and down, but they're rotationally neutral. So it's kind of fun when you're in the suit because they have to take you and hold you like this and see if, which way you go when they let you go and hold you upside down, right side up, and right side and left side. And, uh, and, then, and if you're not perfectly sized to the suit, then you're flopping around in the suit and it's, uh, it can be challenging. Um, we have been, like I said, we've been doing a lot of work recently with Arizona State University in looking at how scientists do field, geological field exploration. And we wanted to have a suit-like uh, environment, but a whole pressure suit is very difficult to take into the field. And you would have to have the geology scientists, ge geologists from uh, Arizona State go through training and certification to wear the suit. So we have a, a whole second series of suits. This is the second generation in that series. It's our letter series, MX Bravo. And this is a suit simulator. It's not pressurized. We use the design of the fabric, the bulk, um, to restrict the joint motions and to add the bulk of a real suit. Um, so we just have ventilation fans that blow air into the helmet. And that's what we tend to use in the field trials. Um, it's a lot of layers. The inside and outside is ballistic nylon. And then we have different kinds of um, just basically bulk packing. That is almost like a quilt uh, to try to build up the bulk, especially around the joints, to get the right restriction in joint uh, angles and in force of motion. Um, and interestingly enough, when you take a person and put them in a giant quilted suit in the middle of the Arizona desert in the summer, it gets a little warm. So we actually are trying to go to places where, you know, we're, we'll be going to the high desert in northern Arizona next month, and in June it should still be fairly cool. Um, this is a, a bioinstrumentation system using multiple inertial measurement units distributed on the, body, on the limb to get a full feedback on arm pose. Uh, yeah. Are you using any of the under armor materials for uh, heat 
are we in trouble if we don't? <laughs> Given how much Under Armour is investing in this campus, are we in trouble if I say no? <laughs> Uh, no, we're not. Uh, it might be a good thing to do, actually. Really? I'd love to find out about that. We're actually uh, thinking about using a water cooling uh, vest under the suit and putting a cooling system, basically a block of ice and water circulation pump into the backpack. To the, uh, the good example was the, uh, uh, the CEO, David Casey, but, uh, the, the alumni, yeah. was making a presentation and he said they actually used this to for some soldiers in Afghanistan. And he said he got a nice note back and he said, this was really great, thanks a lot. You can really, really make 130 degrees feel like 120. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Anyhow, so th this, uh, a year ago when we did this test, this was just the arm, um, the grad student doing this now has a complete body um, garment, including, a, a, you know, basically you're wearing a giant spandex uh, suit, including a, a cap on your head, but there are 18 different nine-axis inertial measurement units, along with a distributed electronic system and wireless connection to a data recording system, so it's like putting on optical targets and running around in a Vicon system, except you don't have to have the optical targets in the Vicon system. So are these really good inertial units? Or is this these are spark fun inertial units. Oh, They're so cheap. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this is really cheap MIM stuff. Um, Can you get decent enough data from that? Um, we're correlating it against motion in a Vicon system. So it still has a few bugs in the software. And except for the fact that Max just got chicken pox, we would be working on it right now. But <laughs> he was told, he, this, he, he actually was sending him off to a conference this week. And right before leaving, he was, wasn't feeling well. And he was told he has chicken pox. And he's not allowed to be around people for the next week. Um, we're really interested in how we uh, put increased data bandwidth going into the human. Visual displays, sound displays, haptics, tactile. You know, trying to be able, when you're inside a suit, you're inside a, you really restricts your interaction with the outside world. Uh, yeah? One more quick question about the inertia. The nine-axis, what good does the magnetometer stuff do? It actually, um, it does you no good at all in space, but in the field it does a lot of good. Yeah, I mean, because we basically can always sense a gravitational vector. And in fact, the, the algorithm for data reduction starts with the magnetometer, with the accelerometer data and magnetometer. Um, and then from that, you more or less have the, po the, the pose of the accelerometer, and then you run through angles to do the inverse kinematics for the body to connect them together so you have something that resembles a reasonable body pose. Now, occasionally you'll see you know, the person going through the pose and you know, the left leg is up around your ear. Um, so we've got to work on filtering. But, uh, but in principle, it would work inside a suit and give us data that you can't get right now. And in fact, we're t uh, he's taking it up to, ILC, no, or to uh, David Clark um, to test on the, in uh, Massachusetts testing their suits later this in about three weeks. Um, the helmet of this suit is oversized. One of the things we're interested in is things like uh, helmet ma head mounted displays. This is an interesting little experiment that we did uh, based entirely on open source <coughs> AR toolkit. But uh, this started off life as a stereo um, head mounted display. Um, stripped down, it actually is translucent, so you can see through it. But if you put an image on the display, all of the non-light regions are overlaid. So you can see through it as long as, it's, as you're sending a white signal to the display. Um, there's a camera mounted on the uh, display. Um, this diver is holding an optical target. When the camera sees the optical target, it puts down a three-dimensional image into your stereo displays based on the relative range and angle to the target. 
So for example, if we wanted to do Hubble, or if we wanted to do International Space Station servicing, uh, when they do this at a much larger tank in Houston, they have the entire space station built and in the tank. So what we would do is we would only build the portions of the station you physically touch. Everything else is a graphic overlay on your image field. And the thing that's neat about that is unlike being in Houston, you don't see a mock-up of the space station in a big blue tank of water. You see the space station in space except this sort of blue haze around your hands and the uh, handrails that you're interacting with. So um, this is extended to our field work. Uh, Kip Hodges is the head of the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State. And one of our test subjects, this is actually a handheld microscope that feeds into the head-mounted displays. Uh, for um, microscopic imaging of rock samples uh, in situ. Um, this kind of ties into our human-robot interactions. We've been doing this for a long time. We first started looking. This is a mid-80s a person in a spacesuit and one of our earliest dexterous robots doing the wide-field camera exchange on Hubble, and that's this unit right here. It's roughly the size and, and mass and shape of a grand piano. And you, again, you have, it has to be extracted very carefully. And we found that the robot, in many cases, was better at that than, than the crew would be. Um, so we were looking at multi-agents. So this is a person in a spacesuit. This is our, ra our initial Ranger free-flying vehicle, in this case, attached to the NASA mo um, functional mock-up of the remote manipulator system and SCAMP free-flying providing a camera view. Uh, we have demonstrated ro a lot of capability for the system, including the ability of a robot to rescue a person who is pretending to be incapacitated. Uh, so this is the other application of Raven, uh, working with the person in our suit mock-up, doing traverses in a simulated uh, planetary surface environment. Um, one of the things that's interesting, uh, most of our work is done in the microgravity environment, you know, orbit uh, environment. Um, we've done a lot of studies of satellite servicing, Hubble servicing. Uh, this is um, basically a, a battery change out for Hubble Space Telescope uh, with, a, with a, you know person in the suit being assisted by the robotic system. Um, we have done a lot of experimentation, gone back and analyzed. Hubble servicing. This is just an example. We have a lot more data than this. But on the first Hubble servicing mission, SM-1, there were five days that a pair of crew went outside in spacesuits for EVA or extravehicular activity. On average, they spent six hours and 15 minutes outside across each of the five days. Um, so we took all the tasks, divided them into tasks best done by humans or best done by robots subdivided the robot tasks into tasks the robot does before the humans show up, the tasks the robot does in collaboration with the human, or a task that the robot does after the humans have uh, finished for the day and gone back inside, and found even for this very dexterous set of tasks that we could cut the servicing time for the humans in half. And in fact, when you went to some of the later Hubble missions where it's more or less pick and place uh, box change out, we could cut the servicing time for the humans by 80%. So we could cut five EVA days down to one by having a robo uh, dexterous robotic collaboration with the humans. Um, we have been looking at different configurations. Um, this is uh, an arm mock-up. It's actually a mock-up of the, the uh, Samurai Deep Submergence Manipulator, but it was used to just do some visualization of how um, manipulators could be mounted to the backpack, could carry hardware, basically give you third and fourth hands. This was shortly before the second um, Spider-Man movie came out, so this became known as Doc Ock mode. Um, we've, we've flown experiments on the space shuttle with astronauts assembling structures. We had, biomed we had a metabolic workload measurements and concluded that about 75% um, of the effort of the crew in a spacesuit goes to moving the spacesuit. Only about 25% goes to doing the task. So he said, what if we could have a spacesuit that stays out of your way? So this is uh, a morphing upper torso. Um, this is actually the first uh, 
test case, I should change this out for a better image. But the idea is that you, we would have uh, linear actuators that pull on these. Every spacesuit made out of fabric uh, called a soft suit has restraint lines to keep it from turning into the, you know, a big balloon. And we uh, came up with the concept of using linear actuators to change the length of the, of the restraint lines in real time. So the idea is no matter how you have to move, the suit just stays out of your way. So that's been very promising. I, a student of mine did a PhD on that e experimentally and then is now off working for a spacesuit company. Is this kind of an adaptive system? Or yeah, well, that's the, um, well basically um, you have to have the same the technology of the, the body garment to know what the body angles are. And then that becomes the input to the to control system. Um, um, Rob Sanner actually, well, we started with a, a, a glove, a, a robotically assisted glove. And Rob Sanner came up with an adaptive nonlinear observer that figured out what the required force was. So this, the glove is a force-driven system. This is actually a position-driven system. But um, we do use nonlinear adaptive controllers for the system to evolve to better correlate to the motion of the person. Um, we've n we have not had the opportunity to take this to a, a human test. So we can move the system response to you know, a computer program, uh, or we could even, now we could do it, not that we have done that, to you know, wear the suit external to the system. Putting the person inside it is a fairly significant step in terms of human use agreements and things like that. Um, this is uh, some vehicle stuff. I'm, I'm going to kind of start. I'm running off on the mouth, and I know I should finish up in an hour. So uh, uh, this is an uh, interesting study that we've been doing um, on alternatives to spacesuits for future applications. This is the um, power augmented glove. Spacesuit gloves don't have a metacarpal phalangeal joint, which means that you don't bend at this joint if you close your hand in space. And astronauts train themselves to bend to the proximal interphalangeals if they want to grasp something, because that's the only joint you have in the suit. Uh, ILC Dover, who makes this, this, the station, or the uh, space shuttle suits, made this a glove with an MCP joint, and it takes 16 pounds of force to actuate it. So we came up with a tendon drive system, and uh, Rob Sanders' nonlinear non adaptive controller um, and in this case, what it basically did was learn the torque characteristics of the joint and counteract it to offset the bias force in the joint. And then you just moved your hand. We don't even do hand sensing. The joint just, it, the, the actuator takes the joint torque from 16 pounds down to a peak of 12 ounces. And that lets you actually have a degree of freedom in your hand that you never had before. We have a, a pressure, a glove box in the lab that we, although this is actually a picture of one at NASA Johnson, where we can do a lot of spacesuit glove testing. Uh, the lightweight actuators I talked about um, have also been adapted. This is a medical rehabilitation system. It's a f uh, five degree of freedom uh, shoulder rehabilitation exoskeleton. So we have to provide the three degrees of freedom of the ball joint at the shoulder, which is itself in your skeletal system articulated, um, compared to your spine on the clavicle and scapula. So we have to compensate for shoulder joint articulation as well as for the rotation around the three degrees of freedom, which this does. It's basically supported by Georgetown Medical School and the Army, and it's for uh, shoulder rehabilitation for very severe shoulder trauma, which is a case of a lot of people coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan um, with uh, IED explosions. Um, this is kind of speculative. Well, one of the things we're trying to, to shoot for in the long term is, a, is a, an entirely power augmented spacesuit. Again, the idea is to try to, to make it be uh, at least as good as being in shirt sleeves, if not um, more capable than being in shirt sleeves. Um, I'll finish up with um, some of the um, system design uh, activity we do. I talked about this one already. A lot of this is an outgrowth of student projects like uh, design classes. Uh, the microsats are actually both, uh, both the, we're doing two of these, the, the one for DARPA with the manipulator and an external inspection robot for International Space Station. I'm sorry, this one is for Air Force. 
The other one is for DARPA and NASA, which is an external free-flying inspection system for uh, space station. And both of them, interestingly enough, it re was required in the proposal phase that you show how it's, it's co integrated into the activities of a senior capstone design course. So we couldn't have gotten either of these without the, the leverage into the design courses. Um, on the other hand, that means they pay us a lot less than they should to do it because, hey, it's students building it. Um, and then there are other you know, student competitions, uh, especially in these days for habitat designs. Um, we have been doing a lot of space habitats. Um, this was a, a project for NASA exploration systems where they wanted the design of the smallest possible habitat that could support four people for two months on the moon. Um, and this is actually quite a small habitat. Um, this is a four-person habitat design, the lower level. Uh, we actually, when we're in the process of doing this, NASA only was asking for uh, design studies. And I uh, pointed out that we had an old surplus water tank out in the parking lot that had, uh, we hadn't used in, a, in more than a decade that was just about the same size as the design we were uh, coming up with. And this was January of 2010, which was a pretty cold month. And before I knew it, the students were out in the parking lot chipping six inches of ice out of the bottom of the tank and refurbishing it. So more or less just because they wanted to do it, they built a full-scale habitat mock-up. So the lower level has an entrance hatch and an airlock and stowage and so forth. And the upper level has four bunks in a configuration that would provide in space would actually have water filling the walls of the bunks to provide radiation protection. Uh, scally and a, a ta table surf folding table surface for food and, and work and so forth. So it, the whole habitat is really quite small, 3.6 meters with two floors. Um, we then did an inflatable habitat uh, the next year, and this year we're building a much larger facility. This is, is a module called Haven. It will eventually be two stories tall, and then we'll drag Eclipse, the earlier module, over and dock to it. So we'll wind up with uh, two cylindrical, two-story habitats docked together, which will give us about 120 square meter, cubic meters of volume. Um, right now, the first level of Haven is pretty much complete. Um, so there are two berths behind here. This is a workstation galley. We do all of these things. It require a lot of education and public outreach. This is actually an outreach to some grade school kids um, who came up with the idea of a greenhouse. So there's an adorable poster from a five-year-old and a seven-year-old explaining the, what plants they chose and how they planted the plants and all of that. And uh, actually, it's thyme and rosemary, so I hope it grows. I'm going to use it at home in the kitchen. Um, this is just sort of the, my last real slide. Um, we have the lab in 1309 of the Kim building, which is a, a robotics development. Uh, we have test hardware for flight uh, systems, uh, electronics fabrication a room off to the sides, a storage room. Uh, at the neutral buoyancy, we have the tank. The suit development lab is now in here. This is uh, pretty much, uh, we used to do a lot more with this, and it's now being slowly taken over by the Rotorcraft Center and the manufacturing building and then our uh, moon yard out in the parking lot. So that is almost exactly an hour. Um, I apologize for talking and not encouraging more conversation, although I'm more than willing to answer any questions or talk for as long as you want to hang out. If you're interested, this is our website and my uh, email address. And you know, feel free to contact me or check out the website or whatever. And with that, I will open it up for any questions or you might have.
technology development or research. You know, so we're really kind of still stuck in the mode of depending on NASA or DARPA or Air Force or somebody that actually wants to fly in space. Good. Oh, um, the did, how much does um, export control and ITAR issues um, impede your research activity? Oh God! Don't get me started. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, uh, I'll buy well, you. Well, I mean, a, a great example. Uh, the DARPA just came up with a program called Phoenix, which and the idea is you have a robot that goes up into orbit, you disassemble old broken satellites and you reuse pieces for new satellites. Right. First of all, as my grad students will tell you, I am a pack rat of the first order. And I've always said that my ultimate goal in life is to run the first space trunk here. <laughs> and we have the technology for doing that whole disassembly, reassembly, all that kind of stuff. So a lot of the areas for the request for proposal were exactly what we are world class at doing. And the conclusion that the legal folks came up with was could not because of DARPA restrictions on publication. We actually have a small piece of it because there's a loophole that if we go in as a subcontractor to another contractor, and they say that, that we're doing basic research and DARPA agrees, then we can get an exclusion. But we can't go in as a uh, My question was along those lines. What, what do you think about this new planetary, planetary resources project that James Cameron came Yeah, I'd love to ask someone's money. <laughs> yeah. uh, I've done a lot of systems analysis of space industrialization, and I think it is undeniable, but depending on your assumption of launch costs and space operations costs, clearly big issues. Sure. Um, there, you can clearly make a business case that a lot of the resources you can find in a nickel iron asteroid could be sold for an enormous profit. If it doesn't cost you, you know, ten thousand dollars a pound to get it into orbit, and then a billion dollars for robots and so forth to go get it. So I think we are beginning to see with SpaceX an approach that should cut the cost of orbit considerably if they can maintain their vertical integration um, to control costs, and if they don't decide to jack up the rates because um, it makes the big contractors, lobbyists happy when they're not drastically undercutting Boeing and Lockheed on launch vehicle costs. I'm almost I apologize. Um, and then if you can if you can get the auto rate stuff, it would be relatively cheap with research. I think you can do it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just saw a headline that said something about to the effect that they were making a profit even without doing anything. So that makes me worried. That makes me worried. It's one of these let's uh, you know find loopholes, get funding, but not actually do stuff. Right. So I'm I'm really waiting to see. This. So do you think in those kind of ventures, you know, the the Well, it depends on people like Elon Musk and Bob Bigelow. Um, Bigelow, who, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he made a fortune with uh, budget suites and a lot of these other long-term stay hotel, uh, hotels, and really wants to operate the first hotel in space, and has actually done a lot of research and development on inflatable habitats. He's flown two inflatable habitats already that are still in space. Um, he actually has interacted with Boeing to build a commercially viable um, tourist transport spacecraft and with Lockheed for a human rated vehicle to fly it on. So if that all came together, I think you could, you could definitely see a role for humans as well as robots, even on these commercial you know, exploration things. Um, Humans are always going to be expensive. In fact, there's a two-day workshop that you know, Goddard just came back from, where you know the, the arguments that were being made for the, the human <coughs> exploration is 640 times more productive than a robot. 
And so if the human costs you less than 640 times as much as the robot, clearly you're making a profit. Or you're, you're getting board science data per dollar, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, and so, so well, that, that's, that's, I actually invented that. It's called the um, Squires number. Steve Squires is, is a principal investigator with Mars Exploration Rovers. So, um, and I was on the, the independent review panel for the Exploration Rovers. And so, you know, during a break one day, I said, so Steve, if you could be physically present in shirt sleeves on Mars, how long would it take you to do what one of your rovers does in a day? And he thought about it and said, well, I'd say, 45 seconds. And so if you figure an eight hour day compared to 45 seconds, it's a factor of 640. Um, so you get a lot more capability with the human and a lot more cost. And you've got to do the trade off is, is, the, is the additional cost with the additional, uh, the additional capability worth the additional cost. But I think it's absolutely clear anything that you do is going to start in a pure robotic way. And so we really need to develop the technology to do the essential robotics via teleoperation or some level of high-level supervisory control or autonomy um, or shrink the robots. That would be really good. Small robotics is really very useful. <laughs> Although I, I have to say our small robots are like huge compared to the small robots. Um, but um, I, th I think all of those are technology that can really help. So for those of you who haven't seen Professor Aiken's facility, I highly recommend before you graduate, you go and take a look at it. Sure. It was uh, one of the most impressive experiences I had when I visited this lab. Uh, so on that note, who are your competitors? And, you know, academically? Because not everyone could have such an amazing facility. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I understand it. In, in terms of facilities and breadth, oh, okay. If my wife were here, she would kick me through. I want to about to say <laughs> because she thinks I tend to be snotty anyway. Yeah. Um, I would say in terms of the facilities and the breadth and the number of projects we have, yeah. we have no competitors yeah. in, in the space business. Um, certainly, in terms of where the people we compete with for graduate students. We're basically competing against universities with much better name recognition factors. MIT, Carnegie Mellon, yes. Stanford. Yes. Um, to some degree, well, actually, no. If you really want to do spacey stuff, you're not going to go to Michigan. You're going to go here. You're going to go to you know. and, and they have interesting capabilities, too. Uh, so you know, I don't want to bad mouth them. Sure. In fact, I was just talking to Fred Whitaker earlier today, and you know, everyone's coming. In this meeting, where it's kind of a small community, we've known each other for decades. Mm -hmm. where I said, "Hey, Dave, how you doing?" Well, I don't you know, writing lots of proposals, trying to stay alive, you know, yes. trying to keep the money flowing. I mean, I would think you should have. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so I said, "So, Red, how are you doing?" He said, "Well, how good could it possibly be?" He said, "I think we're up to sixty-eight million dollars. We've got six hundred people." <laughs> that's not shit. I didn't <laughs> but that's okay. But you know, but but as we all know. Yes. In robotics, Carnegie Mellon is the 800-pound gorilla. Of course, of and course. The community, of course. Um, and and we probably will take a long time to do anything about that. Yeah. So my second question was that I noticed that you have a lot of applications in terms of the sensors that you need for some of the work that you do. Uh, do you ever need a custom-made sensor, a specific sensors that you cannot find it off the shelf? Because we have a number of expertise here, particularly in ISR people work on sensors and electronics. Actually, I think that would be great. I yeah. mean, a lot of this stuff, mm -hmm. a lot of the things I show have been, especially recently, right. are kind of proof of concept when we would like to. One of the things I have found out through the years is if you walk into somebody and say, I need research support and I'm really smart, mm -hmm. you don't get very far. Yes. If you can say, I need research support and here's a working model of what I want to do, you have a lot better chance. Mm -hmm. So we spend a lot of time at places like SmartFund, yeah. where you're buying super cheap, really rock yeah. image sensors. Right. But if you can make that work, then obviously, then you could talk about the real, you know, nice high use of the system mm -hmm. if somebody wanted to support that. Yeah. 
So, and, and I would love to do that, and, and to be honest with you, I'm just basically on, this, on a day-to-day -day rush to try and get things done, and I just don't really think about it. So that's why I was hoping you would come to the retreat. You <laughs> well, don't have space robotics on your list. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Related to a system engineer. Yeah. Do, you, do you see deficiencies in your design process and where or inefficiency, I meant to say inefficiencies in the design process. Thinking about how maybe some of the system engineering methodologies that we uh, have here at ISR might be supportive, maybe even more. Um, especially on system on, on system development through the design courses. Mm -hmm. um, the design courses go has. You know, major blocks dealing with NASA systems engineering uh, protocols. And, you know, since most of the stuff is NASA supported, they really want to see that. You know, and, uh, certainly, having been working with and around NASA for decades, I would be the last person to say that NASA really knows what they're doing in systems engineering. But, you know, if they want to see it done a particular way, that's kind of the way to do it. Um, I would love to, to, you know, find out more about that because it, you know, it's not something um, I spent a lot of time thinking about, but I think there probably are some significant advances over the 40-year-old way NASA does systems in the So we need to get you and Mark Austin together. Yeah. And maybe you and Census people. Yeah. yeah. Anyhow, let's thank our speakers.